And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Rachel Vaughn, professional psychic and aura reader who's had NDEs and a lifetime of otherworldly experiences. Rachel, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Lovely to be here. Rachel, let's start with the beginning of your spiritual journey. And can you tell us how you became psychic? Absolutely. So I come from two family lines that have psychic ability in them. So um, and people are not generally aware of this, but um, psychic ability can be as as plain as the, the eyes in your face. So I have what's called central heterochromia, which is a particular eye color. So around my pupil, there's a different color to the rest of my iris. Um, I'm also, I've also had the green, the green version, which seems to lend to higher abilities with, with psychic ability. So the Hindus believe that people with this particular eye color could see ghosts and, and other worldly entities and could commune with God and, and see the future and those sorts of things. There's another version called full heterochromia. And you see this a lot in, in Hollywood. Um, most of the really high up actors and actresses have either central or full heterochromia. It's quite fascinating if you look it up on um, your search engine, you'll, you'll see it's really common eye colour amongst those people. But uh, particularly with the Marvel franchise, um, like Henry Cavill, who plays Superman and rah, 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 they've all got the, this unusual eye colour. Um, there's telekinesis as well is part of the, the abilities that you have with this particular eye um, colour. And, and obviously, you know, if it's as plain as the eyes on your face and those that, that know about these things can see that, you'll then get picked up and, and chosen for particular, um, you know, um, initiations and, and, and stuff like that. So that's what happened to me from a very early age, was being shown Xena cards or what I assume was Xena cards. Is this just someone being born with lucky DNA? Lucky or perhaps bred for purpose? <laughs> So, so you know, I, I think that the part of the reason why my my parents got together is my father could see my mother had this particular eye colour, so he chose her. Um, it wasn't romantic, but you know, it, it's the, these abilities are pretty much revered um, and and looked for amongst certain societies, you know, because they want they want to bring these abilities out in people. Um, I think everybody is inherently psychic as long as you've got a pineal gland that's healthy and operational, you'll be able to pick up on psychic impressions. And a lot of people don't realise there are quartz crystals in the pineal gland, which is a little tiny gland just behind um, the, the forehead, that, that will pick up, it's like Wi-Fi for the Akashic record. So it's like Googling with your mind. Um, and as long as we don't have a lot of um, fluoride in our system, that pineal gland should work quite well for people. And you can pick up on that information. Yeah, I think the pineal gland is the connection between consciousness and the body. Absolutely. Yeah. And we, we need a science around consciousness. That's one thing we're missing. We desperately need a science for consciousness because we are souls having a human experience. And until we get our heads around the fact that there is a whole, there is parapsychology, but it's limited because of course, psychology tries very hard to make, um, you know, human psychic ability, a pathology and, and schizophrenia, a diagnosis of a schizophrenia, I believe are a really good example of that. Because most of the schizophrenics that I've come across in my reading work, have just simply had attachments or they've been plagued by and harassed by discarnate dark entities. And you can't you can't medicate that away from somebody. That's not going to help them. You, you need to help them to get rid of that sort of thing energetically. What do you think is the percentage of the global population that has your condition? So with the central heterochromia, it's 1% of 1% of the population. And for boys, it's 30% of that 1% of 1%. So it's more common in females. So for boys to have it, it's really very rare. Um, that the, It's only in the Caucasian population. So it doesn't mean that people of other races are not psychic. Of course, that, of course not. You know, that that's a, would be ridiculous. But it's a marker. It's a very clear marker. Like some people would say also, the, um, the widow's peak is also a, a marker of, of certain genetic family lines. Does it have any correlation with RH negative blood? It does, yes. So there is RH negative blood in my family. I don't have it, but um, close members of mine in my nuclear family do. And it's very much inter interconnected. And, you know, some of these particular family lines also have other interesting genetic conditions like haemophilia, um, 
muscular dystrophy in my family, cystic fibrosis. So it's sometimes because these family lions are trying to breed for this particular trait, you'll get inbreeding also, unfortunately. Some people believe that the Rh negative has something to do with ETs or ET human hybrids. Would, would your eye condition be classified as that as well? Potentially. And that's, that's an area that I'm really curious to look into a little bit further. I was, was brought to my attention, um, central heterochromia was brought to my attention by one of my distant cousins, Doug McIntyre, who's done a lot of research on this. And through him, I've learned that the RH negative blood is also a factor. Um, I, I would say yes. I would say it's very likely that there's some sort of hybridization that's gone on. Um, yeah, it, it's an interesting thing that there are other factors, like I, I have very unusual teeth. I have tricuspid teeth, not bicuspid, um, and some of the, the molars, which is also a, one of the, the, the signs of um, these sorts of family lines as well. Yeah, not that, that I'm saying there's any hierarchy. Anybody can be psychic. It's just very interesting that I just happened to come from one of these lines. And I was taught from a very early age. Can you tell us about some of your first memories being psychic or recognizing it? Yeah, so um, like I said, one of my first memories was being shown what someone has told me must have been a Xena card. I was very small, pre-verbal. I still had a dummy in my mouth, but I was being held up by my father while um, these cards were shown to me and it was my task to work out what the person in the next room that I could not see, what card they were looking at. And so that was one of the tests. Um, I also was able to read auras from a very early age. And so this was something that was uh, utilised uh, because you can tell from a person's aura whether or not they have malefic tendencies, if they're a kind person, um, if they're psychic. Also, you can see in, in the frequency and the colours around the body. So that was also something that um, I was trained to use a lot. Um, also, I would commune with otherworldly entities. So I would act as a medium from a very early age also. Um, and some of those weren't such nice experiences, but um, I'm a medium now um, and I've learned, you know, it's interesting because, you know, I'll read for people and I'll pick up from the impression of the, the soul on the other side, which dimension they're in, whether or not they're in what I call the recovery dimension, which is where I went to um, uh, when I had my NDEs, um, which is an absolutely beautiful dimension. It's warm, the, the, the grass feels like the softest fur, the colours are spectacular, the sun's always shining, it is absolutely beautiful. And that to me is a fifth dimensional um, space where all the other dimensions lead off to. So if you are, if you've just had a very difficult passing, you'll go into the recovery dimension for as long as you feel necessary until you decide to move into um, whichever dimension your soul frequency acts as a key to the lock for. So you can't pass into another dimension unless you have the requisite frequency. It's not possible. I want to run something by you because I think that's fascinating. I've never heard that realm or dimension called the recovery dimension. And I've yeah. kind of narrowed it down to about three to five places where people go during an NDE. And I'll, I'll let you know, or I'll tell them to you, and then maybe you might know what they are. Yeah, sure. And one obviously is like that, like something that's kind of paradise, like, like this, the colors and beautiful forest. Another one is they go to the black void. That's a very common place people go to. Do you know what that is for? I'm not saying that everybody who ends up in the black void has made the wrong decisions in life, but when I connect with people who've been there, usually they have enormous regrets, enormous regrets. So so if I'm reading for somebody whose father, say, is in that, in that dimension, I'll know that they did something in their lifetime that they have not forgiven themselves for. And so they they pretty much will stick themselves in that spot. And it is black. There's there's no colour. There's no light. There's nothing. It's just darkness. And usually it's very, very lonely. They usually are on their own completely and, and running from worse entities that are trying to consume them. And this is what people don't seem to realise. The dark, if you make the wrong decisions in life and you are a selfish individual, you will go down into the dark realms at some point, you know, if, if, if depending on the the depth of and um, the depravity of the of the um, selfishness, but those dark realms are predatory. Light realms are not. If you if you go into the heavenly realms, you will simply just expand, expand, expand forever, as you get to higher and higher levels of light. In the dark realms, you can be consumed. 
so yeah in, in that realm I, I often will notice that they are terrified of something that's trying to get at them here's a fascinating one people go to a room that's like a that's like a waiting room like a lobby you know what i mean and sometimes there's someone yep. there in charge and i've always wondered what is that place about that again is another aspect of what i would describe as the fifth dimensional what i call the fifth dimension like a train station all the other dimensions come off it but you've got to go to the train station to get your train to your dimension and there's different aspects of it so what we've described here um the dark dimension i feel is one of the one of the other actual doorways so um, to the darkest sort of realms, but that 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 train station, that's you'll get your waiting rooms, you'll get your um, recovery dimension, you know, you'll you'll get your areas like that where different souls will go to different places. And what's really interesting is depending on what your belief is of what where you're going to, your guides or those who've gone before you who are trying to help you to make that transition will present it to you what you're expecting so that you don't feel terror, so you feel comfortable and you know you know where you're going. So a lot of people, you know, Hollywood's taught about the, the light, going into the light, that I feel is possibly, because that wasn't my experience with my NDEs, I was one minute in a not so nice experience and the next minute in the recovery realm being being explained to me that there were things that I needed to go back and do um, or come back and do. So I think just like, you know, when you've got something that's dark, that's harassing somebody, they will play on the person's greatest fear. And so if you're scared of spiders, you'll have have you know an experience with an enormous spider in a dream or something like that or or, or in your um physical waking state which is pretty horrifying so it's it's um it's really interesting because the fifth dimension is also what the ley lines are um that 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 fifth dimensional frequency is what all those ley line um um corridors are and that's where also you know you have all these other entities will come into the third dimension through that fifth dimensional corridor, which is a ley line, um, which is also the Earth's soul frequency, and it's also the repository for the Akashic record, which is, you know, all things that have ever happened on Earth, past, present, and future, all thoughts, all feelings, all events. All right, you're bringing up some really good stuff, and I want to go there, but I want to finish with this NDE stuff yeah, 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 cool. first. <laughs> uh, some people go out to the cosmos, out in space, you know, is that a certain dimension or what do you think that is? I would say that that is another form of expansion. So again, light souls expand, um, dark souls contract. So that would be, I've, I've had, um, I've astral traveled um, cosmically and it's been pretty amazing until I realized how far away the earth was when I could see it beneath me. I freaked out and landed back in my bed so hard that my partner <laughs> woke up rather violently. Um, so that to me would be another um probably another expression of the fifth dimension in a way because it's still not quite in in another dimensional space but it's it's traveling now some of my guests talk about that the reincarnation cycle is a trap this is a whole soul trap we keep getting recycled over and over again they trick us into saying you've got things to do you have to go back and if you go to the black space the black void, that's the way out of the trap. What do you think about that? My experience of the black void is somewhere that you would want to avoid. That's just my personal opinion. Doesn't mean that your other guests are incorrect. It's just my personal opinion. Um, I believe, so I believe we come to the third dimension by choice to go through a series of lessons to get to a graduation soul frequency. That is, that's my personal opinion. And those that decide to be selfish will go down into the red sort of um, aspects of the of the soul frequency and end up in a in a demonic realm. Well, previous to recent events, I saw the earth as like a primary school, secondary school. So we come here to learn our lessons as quickly as possible. A lot of souls want to come to a third dimensional planet like um, earth because you can learn your lessons quickly. And so we come here to decide whether or not we're selfish or altruistic. Uh, those that to selfishness will end up in a, in a dark realm at the end of their um, lessons and in, in incarnations. So we get to a graduate level once we get to either end of the electromagnetic spectrum, the visible light spectrum. So red frequency is dark, um, violet frequency is is light, is altruistic. That's the, the end of the incarnations. However, 
we are at what I believe is the 25,000 year mark of a 26,000 year incarnation cycle. Um, we're coming into a golden age. That is marked by the fact that we're coming into permanent harmony time of the ley lines. So the Earth's frequency is coming into harmony, which is fifth dimensional, at December of this year. So we, I don't believe, are stuck in that prison planet thing anymore. In fact, I a couple of years ago, I was given the information from my guides that we're not stuck in that anymore. We can, we can choose to opt out. And it's interesting because I don't see any new souls coming in anymore. All I see... When I read for people, and mind you, people who go to a psychic usually are psychic themselves and usually reasonably high frequency souls. Those that are pregnant are that are coming in to, to have a reading with me are have babies coming in that are out of this world, exceptional soul frequencies. So we're not I know I don't see these influxes of new souls that I used to see that are just starting, just embarking on a on a um an incarnation cycle. That may happen again, but I I don't feel that we're going to be stuck in these incarnation cycles either with us going into the fifth dimension. Um, mind you, I don't have all the answers. Perhaps we, we, perhaps the earth always comes up to this fifth dimensional frequency at the end of each 26, 25,000, 26,000 year cycle. So it's a, it's a very interesting uh, time to be alive. It's a, it's a wonderful time to be here. What are these ley line corridors that you mentioned? Okay, so ancient peoples have been talking about ley lines forever. Uh, unfortunately, you know, Western science likes to pretend that they don't exist. So ley lines are fifth dimensional frequency. They are ge geomagnetic energy frequencies that are part of the Earth's soul system. They actually are visible. So if you're standing in the cross section of a ley line, it will appear as a perfect circle in front of you. Usually with the plants and trees, this is the it's easiest to see them um, in endemic forest that hasn't been you know raised to the ground and rows of trees put in. Um, because the endemic forest is all symbiotic, it all grows naturally and it naturally avoids growing within the ley lines. So you'll end up with these corridors going through nature that if you stand in the right position, you'll see it's this perfect circle. And quite often it comes up really well on photographs. So I photographed so many of these and shared them um, and I've been teaching on this for quite some time now. So you can see ley lines, you can feel them, you can douse for them. And they are, like I said, a repository for the Akashic Record, they're the Earth's soul system. But they're also where all the other otherworldly entities will access the third dimensional space. So you will see fairy entities. You'll sometimes see some dark things there. Um, you'll see angelic beings. Um, you will often see what's called the spirit of the forest, um, or some people call it the green man. Ancient peoples have been talking about this particular spirit of the forest for a very, very long time. And that means that because the spirit's trying to communicate with humanity, they will show humanoid features in the plants or trees. Sometimes in the bark of the tree, there'll be a face. Sometimes just the way that the tree um, is moving in the wind, um, the leaves will make up a, a particular face that you can see. Now, people might say, oh, that's, you know, pareidolia. And, and again, psychiatry likes to make everything that's spiritual into some sort of pathology. But what basically what you're seeing is, is it's an, um, an intelligence communicating with you. So you can see it as the earth communicating with you. You can see it with um, as, you know, the fairy realm, which is not just little Tinkerbell types. The fairy realm encompasses an enormous number of different soul frequency entities that take care of the earth. They'll show themselves in the ley lines as well. And what they're doing is basically saying, pay attention, there's something really significant about this place. And we want you to know because humanity is supposed to be the custodians of the earth we're supposed to be caring for her making her healthy so these entities are showing themselves even more now um, to try and get our attention because we're in a we're in a situation where the earth needs balance brought back to the ley lines there's been imbalance brought in for various reasons we see a lot of arenas um like like, like the arenas of old in roman days where they used to do terrible things in the, the arenas now they do it in a different way for loose energy um courts um, Masonic temples, um, churches, uh, there are court, um, sorry, um, jails, hospitals. A lot of these places are actually built on the crossing of powerful ley lines. And the crossing points, her portals and vortexes, the frequencies, the experiences in those spaces program the earth for those frequencies. So if every time you build something in one of those spaces and it's for negative expression, 
Hospitals aren't pleasant to be in. Jails are terrible. Courts are often where people don't see justice, unfortunately. You're programming the earth for not so great things. So what I'm trying to do at the moment is to help people to recognise how important the ley lines are. Um, I have a, 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 a movement that I'm doing with a, a beautiful friend, Ben Hawkes, where we're trying to help people to learn to go out into the ley lines, find them in endemic spaces where you've got natural forest, where the mycelium is helping all of the forests to communicate with one another um, and, and seeing or bringing really beautiful high frequency um, energy to create balance, to, to balance what has been an imbalance for quite some time. Did you say that the Akashic records are located in the ley lines? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. So again, I think yeah. I would think, you know, most people think they're in some other dimension somewhere, like out in space. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, we're often told that, but why would you keep the library for the earth outside of the earth? I mean, the earth is the repository for that information. And this is why people can go to sacred spaces and pick up on timelines from ancient timelines and and channel through information from those ancient timelines what you'll also see a lot of the time is the ley lines will follow quartz seams in the earth and quartz is literally a database so you'll you'll see ley lines on beaches as well because sand is is quartz uh so and also you know the quartz um so anywhere that there's granite you'll see a lot of ley lines as well so it heightens those frequencies they're more visible in those locations and if you think about quartz pineal gland, there's quartz in the pineal gland, there's quartz in every watch, every computer, every phone, it helps to pick up on these frequencies. It picks up on Wi-Fi energy or electromagnetic frequencies and makes sense of it. And so that's what the Akashic does. It 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 travels, it it allows us to access it through the ley lines. Would you say that most of the ancient temples around the world have ley lines running through them? Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people have studied this phenomenon um, and and pointed out that there's these these alignments, like the Bali to Bensdale alignment, for, for example, this one that goes all the way from Bali to a place in Victoria called Bensdale. There are so many sacred sites. There are so many military bases, underground bases, those sorts of things along those like that particular ley line. And that ley line... Um, it's a really powerful one. It, go, it goes across also Uluru, which is a sacred space, a chakra point on the earth in the middle of Australia. So, again, we've got a lot of um, a lot of people do know about these things, but it's kept very hidden because they want to program the earth for things that are the antithesis of what us with good souls want for the earth. So, you know, vigilance is in, it's, is necessary at the moment. What chakra point is Uluru? So there's a wonderful man called Robert Jameson who wrote a book on the Bali to Bansdale alignment. And he has taken his understanding, his knowledge, um, original peoples from Australia's knowledge, and he has um, ascertained that it is the sacral chakra, and which makes a lot of sense because it's the it's the womb, it's the ovaries um, of, of the earth. So, and this is it's often been said that Africa is where humanity began, but it sort of makes more sense to me from what I've studied that um, it's actually Australia is, is the is the beginning point. So he calls it the God gamete theory. It's fascinating. I really recommend people read his book. Um, so it, it's interesting because there's some con conjecture over that. Some people say it's the navel chakra. But to me, because Uluru is a bright orange rock, and I know about some frequencies and colours, you know, relating to chakras, to me it makes more sense that it'll also be um, the, the sacral chakra, the sexual chakra. Are you aware of the other chakra points on the planet? Yes. So Glastonbury um, and Avesbury, that area in the UK, is believed to be the heart chakra. Um, Mount Shasta, I believe, is supposed to be the crown chakra. Um, again, the and it's interesting, the third eye chakra, apparently it moves around. So I've I've read recently that it, it's likely to be around the UK again. It's it's moved into that sort of area. Um, I've forgotten where the base chakra is. Um, I know Lake Lake Titicaca. I don't think I said that right. Um, that's supposed to be one of the chakra points as well. So there are so the chakra points are basically where the dragon lines cross. Um, there is. There were six pairs of dragon lines on the world in up until about 2012. And according to Rory Duff, who's a geobiologist, um, 
he said that basically in 28, 2017, a new dragon line appeared, another one appeared in 2018, and then another one again in 2019. So we went from six pairs to these extra three, which is very significant, especially given we're coming up to harmony time at the end of this year in December. So, and that's permanent harmony time. Normally harmony time happens four times of the year at the equinoxes and solstices. So this is really, this is a big thing, what we're coming into. But yeah, where the dragon lines cross over the land, that's considered to be a chakra point. And if you think about the pretty crazy time we've had in the last four years since those new, four or five years, um, since those new three new dragon lines appeared, it's sort of a bit of an understanding about why things have been so full on. Now, what's the difference between a dragon line and a ley line? These are the most significant, the, the most powerful of the ley lines. Um, generally a ley line, the ones that I photograph um, are along the south coast of South Australia where I, I, I like to frequent because there's some really beautiful places, a lot of quartz um, along the south coast of South Australia as well. Most of them are roughly about two metres across when you photograph them. So again, you can douse for them, but you can also see them. They're, qu they're, they're quite easily visible. So the majority are roughly about that two metre across. There's scarcely, according to Rory Duff, there's scarcely a square kilometre on the face of the earth that doesn't have at least one of these ley lines in it. So they are everywhere, but the dragon lines are just the most significant. What about portals? Are there any portals within the ley lines or dragon lines? Absolutely. So where you've got your dragon lines, that where they cross, the chakra points are literally massive portals. And if you look at spaces like... Um, the Vatican's a really good example. I won't go into it too much, but if you look at the courtyard, it's a big circle and it's marking out an enormous portal. So it's not necessarily, a. I don't believe it's dragon lines crossing in that spot, but there's significant lines crossing in that area and that's created an enormous portal that actually goes underground. Most of the portal spaces and a lot of um, geobiologists and ley line hunters talk about them being vortexes, so we'll use that term as well. I like portals, it makes more sense to me because I know where those ley lines cross, where those portal spaces are, all the other dimensions come off. And so th these are spaces where you can go in and meditate if you've got the right kind of energetic protection and communicate with a lot of otherworldly entities. It's a lot easier in a portal space um, than it is necessarily in, in a ley line or in just in, in, in any spot. Um, so the, the, where, the, where the ley lines cross, you will get these minor portals, smaller smaller energy um, centres that are, are a sphere. You can literally see them as well. I've photographed them also. They are spherical spaces. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. What surprises me is that it's not that well known that you can see them, whereas ancient peoples have been talking about seeing them. I mean, the, the American Indians based the medicine wheel on the perfect circle because they knew that they were visible. So, yeah. Um, it's it's my passion at the moment to share that with people as much as possible because people if they don't know how to douse they won't necessarily be able to find them but everybody's got a pair of eyes and what's really interesting to me is it's the people who've done my course that have central heterochromia or full heterochromia seem to pick them up a little bit more easily so there are things um photoreceptors magnetoreceptors in the human eye a human retina heavily expressed in the human retina called cryptochromes this is a scientific fact, and these are the same magnetosensors that birds and insects use to navigate the earth using ley lines. So we can see them, um, and, and I'm, I'm presuming there are other mammals that must be able to see them as well. I know that dingoes in my country use them to um, navigate. In fact, a, a course member of mine shared a photograph of a dingo sitting right in the centre of this ley line, beautiful circle around it, staring straight at the at the camera, at the, at the course member, Jim just basically saying, have a look, I'm standing here for a reason. Yeah, and then I found out from other original people that that they use them to navigate. And this is the thing, if you go out into an endemic forest and you need to travel through that forest, you will go to the path of least resistance. And it's a ley line because the plants and trees avoid growing within them. When they do grow within them, they grow very strangely and they'll be very tortured looking and kind of twisted. So that's another sign for, for a ley line as well. Uh, so, you know, animals, um, echidnas, rabbit, uh, rabbits, um, kangaroos in my country, they use the ley lines as well. And, and ancient people here have been using them forever. They call them song lines because they have a, a sound frequency as well. And they are actually sound and light frequencies. It's not just the light, it's, it's the sound as well. Can you show us some of your photographs? Yeah, absolutely.
So this is a great example of pareidolia. Now, this is not necessarily the trees and plants showing it, but you can see a face there in that rock, and this is a really sacred site. I'm not 100% sure where it is. I mean, it's it's undeniable. And so this is a sign that there's probably a portal in this location. So pareidolia, as, as, as psychology calls it, is, is powerful. This is a great example as well. This is a friend of mine, Claire Woodley. Um, she's taken a photograph of the of the clouds, and you'll see, you know, entities will show themselves in in the clouds as well. There's two what I would describe as indigenous faces: a male and a female, um, nose, eye, lips, chin, nose, lips, chin. So I'll just go through and see if I can um, find some really good ley line pics. So if you notice, there's a circle here. It's oh, I've marked it. So mm -hmm. they reverberate out. Now, again, this is a natural path. It's not been paved. The Romans were well aware of this. Most of the Roman roads in the UK are on ley lines. And, you know, in the UK, and I'll just I'll just keep going through and showing where the, where the lays are in these pegs, where the Roman roads, where they crossed in significant places, they would have their ritual spaces in those portals. And then the Catholic Church came along and use the ritual stones as foundation stones for the church and in order to get people to actually go into the church they would start they actually depicted the green man or the, the um, spirit of the forest so this this is one of my favorites because um the dogs in there love dogs um it's got a big stick so this is from the other direction so you can see lays if you if you go out and you find a ley line in nature um take a 380 photograph take one in one direction turn around take it in the other direction because you'll often see it going in both directions so this dog is running in one direction and then you see it going in the opposite and that's the little water water source water will magnify the visibility of a ley line also so that's just a little comparison you can see and you can see this beautiful line here and it's not just shadow because i've i've got i've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these photographs this is the one I was just describing with the dingo. So, and this is quite an amazing story, actually. Jim also had a photograph. I haven't shared it because it's very private, but he took a photograph on the same evening um, of a lump of wood in the fire that actually looked exactly like a dingo, um, the way that it had burnt. So he was communing with the dingoes on that particular um, day. But I have marked that one. So you can just see a different, a different frequency. And there's a comparison. And quite often, if you look at these um, photographs in um, a thumbnail form, it'll be much clearer. So I don't know if you can see how much more clearly that line is, that circle is showing itself. And again, roads, roads are a really good example because again, especially you know, in places where it's very heavily wooded, if you've got People wanting to, you know, traverse that particular area, they're going to go through again the path of least resistance. So I do have some depictions. That this is something that my, um, and again, you know, this is a court scene as well. Um, this is in Bendigo in, in Australia, and there's a there's a beautiful lay showing itself there. And I've just done a comparison, and there's multiple here. This one I think is really lovely because this is a beach. There's not a lot of plant matter on this beach. The path could have gone through here or any other part where there's just sand, but instead the path goes through these trees where there's a ley line actually parting the trees and you can see um, the shape of it. And again, you know, it's unmistakable in, in the thumbnail form. It's often much more obvious in the smaller pictures. That's how I actually noticed this phenomena. I had taken a series of photographs, come home, they're on my computer, I walked away, came back and noticed, what's that circle doing there in the middle of my photograph? And then, and that was because it was in thumbnail form and I could see it more, more clearly. A lot of these photographs were shared with me from course members, so I have to thank them. This is actually an old Bora site. Um, Bora rings were sacred ceremonial sites for the original people in my country. And where you have a Bora ring, which is basically a portal or vortex where a lot of ley lines cross, you'll see a whole series of lays coming into that space. So there's a whole heap of ley lines in this particular spot. So I have taught a masterclass on this, and that's where they, they come into um, the portal space. For 
my project and, and my dear friend Ben Hawke's project called Lay Love Down, L-E-Y Love Down. Um, we taught a masterclass and these are some of the pictures that I shared in the masterclass. So again, it's sometimes a lot more obvious in thumbnail, but there's, there's one very clear one there. And the other thing is too, in these areas, there will be pareidolic images. That's just a comparison. So you'll see, you know, humanoid faces in the trees and the bark of the trees, sometimes in shadows on the ground, in the clouds above, um, in the water as a reflection. There's all there's always these, the spirit of the forest communicating with us at the same time. Um, this is a really amazing one. Um, so I've got photographs from multiple angles. This was called the Witch's Grove. I think it's in the Netherlands from memory. This is from a course member. But you can see the ley line in these pictures from different angles and in with different backgrounds. So see how tortured these trees are. This is a really good example of what happens to trees when they grow around particular kinds of ley lines. The smaller lays, like this is quite a small one, um, can be negatively affecting. So I'll just go back again. So you can see that the lay there, if you look at it from this different angle, it's not just a mark in the in the um, leaves. It's, you can see it's causing the circle here as well. And I do have a comparison in a minute. Can't see it from that angle because of the bar across, but there you go. So we've got three different photographs, different angles but the lay shows itself in the same spot in each photograph. Please don't, don't share your iris publicly. I am a very public person. I've put a lot of my stuff out there, so I am doing this because I, it's for educational purposes. My suggestion is you don't share your iris because it is a way of um, identifying you. And, and please don't share your children's irises. Oh, my gosh. Um, so this is an example of central heterochromia. This is why I was earmarked for psychic teeth being taught about um, how to be used as a psychic tool from a very early age, from, from some of my earliest memories are, are from being um, trained. So the, the number of different colours in the iris will indicate higher abilities for picking up on otherworldly entities, communicating with entities, mediumship, um, being aware of different dimensions, picking up on ley lines, etc. So, um, and again, you know, just don't, don't share images like this normally. Um, there are uh, different places that you can go to have your iris photographed i would just be very careful to make sure that if you do have that done that you don't sign anything to say that they can then have access to that yeah it's a bit like having your, your dna um profiled thank you for showing us those pictures of the ley lines because i feel like i may have seen them before but never really you know paid attention and put it all together like you have. So now if I see it again, I'll understand. Yeah. And you might you might notice you have a different feeling in that place, Jeff. Uh, and there's a reason for that. And also, you know, pay attention to, you know, you might see a face somewhere and you might not be expecting it. Um, because this is the interesting thing. Once people learn this technique, they become more aware. It's it's like it's like turning off the veil. Um, and what's amazing at the moment too, I've, I've been photographing these ley lines for 10 years or over 10 years, it's probably more like 12 years now. And I sat on it and sat on it because I knew it was going to be significant and I knew I'd have to share it at some point, but wasn't sure when it would need to be done. And, and it's been a bit over a year now that I've been teaching about it. The veil is is disintegrating. So the veil is something that I'm sure a lot of people have talked about on, on your program. From, the, from, from birth till about five years old, the veil starts to um, descend on on humans having a soul having a human experience so that we forget our past lives we, we don't commune with otherworldly entities anymore we just have a human experience if you're opened up at some point or allowed to keep connecting with those those otherworldly entities or your mediumship abilities or whatever then that won't descend completely but for most well actually not most anymore probably about 50 percent of the population having psychic impressions is not something that they can they can do. That veil that's preventing people from having those psychic impressions is disintegrating rapidly. I actually, I estimate that by, by December, when the harmony time comes, we just won't have a veil anymore. When I tune in and read for people who are pregnant now, I, I just keep being told that these children, these babies coming in, the veil will never be something that's part of their life. So we're coming into a time of intense spirituality where people are going to be aware of everything that goes on around them. One benefit of the fact that we're coming into the harmony time with the ley lines in December, the permanent harmony time, is that the otherworldly dark entities 
will not have the same control. They won't have the same power as we come into 5D. So there'll be less of that. As a psychic, what have you seen in our near future between now and the end of the year? There have been certain things that have happened over the last four years that some people are still not quite sort of aware of um, with top-down approach is the way I would describe it. By October, everybody's going to pretty much know that that has occurred. So I don't want to talk about that too much, but that's something that I keep being shown. I believe that we will see the collapse of certain top-down structures. And I think as we come into 2025, 2026, what we're going to see is the judiciary, judiciary will change. Uh, health, the way we know it now, will change. Education will change. The way we institute child protection will change. Um, food, the way we grow our food, that will change. So we're coming into a whole new paradigm and it's much, much kinder. It's much more for health, freedom and prosperity for all humanity, not just those who have that 1% control. Well, in order to create this new paradigm, the old structures have to disintegrate. But I actually see that as a positive thing. So it might, I hope it doesn't instill too much fear in people, but we are going to see destruction. I mean, governments are going to fall across mm. the world. Wow. And I think it's going to be one after the other, after the other, after the other. That's between now and the end of the world? Um, so. Um, I mean, end of the year? <laughs> <laughs> They're, they're, it's going to start. It's going to start before the end of the year. But, but by twenty twenty six, I I personally don't think we're going to have governments anymore. I see committees. I don't see governments, and I don't see it as part of. Um, I don't see us coming into some sort of socialist nightmare either. And I've never seen that. I've never seen that. I also see we're bifurcating timelines at the moment too, because there are some people that just will not wake up, that will go into this AI nightmare led situation but those that, that have come up to a high enough frequency will not go into that those that are aware and awake will not go into that and this is why it's so important for all of us to share as much information as possible to wake up as many people as possible which is why you know your platform is so important danny's danny henderson's platform is so important you know so many people are doing this work at the moment to wake people up but i'm i'm actually an eternal optimist so it's difficult for me to see something negative because <laughs> i always see the positive in it so it's I was listening to Pam, Pam Gregory the other last night, actually, and she was saying, you know, if you're having your kitchen renovated, you've got to go through the process of it having having it all ripped out before it looks all shiny and new. And that's what we're coming into. This this we're getting we're going through the ripping out phase. Can you explain more about the twenty five thousand year cycle that we're coming to an end to? Yeah. So so in my belief system, we have cycles of twenty six thousand years within which we incarnate. I'm on my third cycle. So clearly in previous cycles, I didn't get to the level that I wanted to, or I stuffed up in some way. And I've got a bit of an idea of how I did stuff up. At this point where we are at the moment, we are 25,000 years in to a 26,000 year cycle. This last thousand years that we have is golden age. It's literally a golden age. And I, I heard stories of us coming into 5D and thought it was a fairy tale. And I talk about a lot of really interesting things. Um, and normally I'm very open-minded, but I thought it was a fairy tale until I heard, again, Pam Gregory, an astrologer that I love to watch, um, and this incredible gentleman, Rory Duff, who's a geobiologist, talking about this permanent harmony time of the ley lines in December of this year. And it was just immediate. I just recognized, I think Pam even said something along these lines in that interview, that's 5D. That's where we're going into fifth dimension. What would the regular people like me notice when this happens? So we're already in a, in November of last year, we started an astrological alignment of truth that's going to last for four years from November of last year. And you can see it already. The truth is coming out everywhere. Even the mainstream media are talking about things that, that they weren't talking about before. So that is part of the process. You'll see more truth coming out. You will see, I'm actually getting that the colours are going to be brighter, which is really interesting. So we're going to have, it's going to, the world will look a little bit shinier, a little bit prettier, which is interesting. So I think that there are certain electromagnetic frequencies that perhaps are causing a, it could be the veil, a flattening, a dulling of the colours that will suddenly be brighter. 
this I hope will bring people out into nature more because that's what we need to do. A lot of, you know, it's wonderful to have access and to be able to connect with people across the world through our devices, but it also takes us away from the natural world. So I can see a lot of people going more into the natural world and being more connected with the earth and, and the animals and the plants and trees and wanting to commune with them more. I think time will be slightly different. Um, I, I get a sense that we will live longer. So that's another thing that we'll be seeing. And I think that because the, the ley lines are coming into permanent harmony time, because we're coming into this fifth dimensional frequency for the whole earth, I personally think that our interactions with otherworldly entities will become more common. Now, one benefit of all these devices that we have everywhere is that people can actually photograph and film things more readily because we've all got a we've all got a camera or a video camera on us, you know, 24-7 generally. We'll see a lot more of that too. So people doubting that we're living in a multidimensional existence, that we are multidimensional beings. Every chakra point connects us to a different dimension. These, these sorts of things will be more recognized. So that's that's some of the changes that I'm that I've been showing that will be coming up. I don't know if you have an interest, but if you do, do you see anything with ETs coming soon? They've always been here. They've always been here. Um, and I think it's really irrational um, to think that they don't. There, there are so many planets just within our own Milky Way galaxy that can hold life, that, that are, are habitable, that live within a habitable zone of a, of a sun. Um, so it's just ridiculous to think that we do not have other world, other other um, beings in the world around us. I mean, that's just stupid. So they've always been here. I've had my ET experiences. Um, I haven't talked about very much publicly. Um, there are many different types as well. Um, this is another fascinating thing with um, the portals um, where you have ley lines crossing, vortex portal spaces. A lot of people will see cryptids within those spaces. So these portals are timeless. And so you can see back in time, you can see forward in time. I've had an experience of um, being in a very powerful portal space outside of Port Elliot um, on the south coast of South Australia. And I looked across at a tree nearby and there were two megafauna um, uh, um, marsupials from, from about 50,000 years ago staring back at me. It was really, really bizarre. And the, the kangaroo had a very weird sort of humanoid snubbed face, which they had back then. I was staring at them. They were staring at me. We were both astonished. Like they, they, they were freaked out. Like I was freaked out. Um, I went off to the library afterwards to try and work out were there megafauna in that area, you know, at some point, and they were about fifty thousand years ago. So that's one example you can see. You know, I think some people will go out in nature and they might come across one of these portals and see what they think might be a dragon. It could be a dinosaur from a past life that you know that, that were obviously dragons. Um, I've heard people talk about um, seeing, I've, I've seen a, a werewolf entity in one of these spaces in a in a park where dogs refuse to go in, which is really interesting. It happened to be that kind of um, cryptid entity. I've heard about people talking about Bigfoot, Yowies, those sorts of entities in these spaces. So if you're going to see something like that, it's usually going to be in one of those spaces. Rachel, you've given us a lot of fascinating information today, and people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do teach a course on all of these subjects, if anybody's interested. So if they want to go to my website, www.number66science, so 6thscience.com, they, um, they could either send me a message there or they could you know, enrol for a reading or a um, part of my course. I've got a course running in September that's coming up soon, um, another one in November and one in February, if anybody's interested in doing that. You got anything else that you're working on that you want people to know about? Absolutely. So my, my greatest passion at the moment is teaching people how to see ley lines. Um, I have the Lay Love Down project, which is www.laylovedown, L-E-Y, lovedown, all one word, dot com. Ben and I uh, are co-founders. We are teaching people how to find ley lines, how to go out into the ley lines and bring balance back into the lays. Because like I said before, a lot of these really powerful lays have a lot of, you know, military bases and 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 stadiums where they, they suck up loose energy. And we need to go out there and balance out those frequencies to bring the earth into balance and to give her 
help her as she comes up to this harmony time. We can make this transition smooth. We can win this energetic war. We just need to do it in the best possible way. Rachel, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Absolutely. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that we are coming into a golden age. The reason I believe that is because from 2015, um, the clients that were coming to me for readings who were pregnant, the vast majority of them, the, the babies in their tummies were gold souls. So the aura shows the frequency of, of the person, of, the, of the, the soul in that human experience. Gold souls are equivalent to what I describe as a Christ consciousness level. So Mother Mary, Jesus Christ, had golden auras for a reason. They were that frequency. All of these gold souls coming in and suddenly through the last four years, people, humanity coming up to a much higher levels of soul frequency. Normally it takes lifetimes to go up one level. I've seen people go up levels, levels in the last four years. So we wouldn't be doing all of that and all of that hard work and dealing with all our traumas and healing in such a sort of spectacular way to be coming into something that would be a nightmare. That is not what I see. I see a thousand years that are coming up where we're going to be living as we should have been living for a very long time. So that's, that's my message. Rachel, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.